it off, or would you like us? Go, go, go. Are you okay to do it? Go ahead. Okay, so um, thank you all for coming. Um, we asked you to come tonight as a school board group um, because we need to move forward on our plan to address Act 46, um, the Vermont law that requires that we tell the, the Board of Education and the Secretary of Education how we plan to um, move forward with governance of our school. And um, right now we're at kind of a crossroads, and what we need most of all right now at this point is input from our community. So that's why we asked you to come here, and we're so glad that you have come. And what we most hope for tonight is that you will tell us what you're thinking. Um, and we're, we're here, of course, to answer questions and help you understand um, where we are in the process and what the various options are and what the, some of the pros and cons might be to those different options. Um, so just to get us started, I guess, um, Act 46 is a law that has five basic goals. And I had a little slideshow, but we have several um, Apple products here and only PC connectors, so we can't use them, <laughs> just a technical problem. But um, the major goals of Act 46 are to improve equity of opportunities for students in the state of Vermont. So we're looking for equity for all students. Um, the quality of education, so kids are meeting the standards that our state has written um, outcomes for education. So equity, quality of education, um, efficiency, so operational efficiencies, and then transparency and accountability. And all of those four goals at a value, that's the fifth goal, is value for the taxpayers. So that's what Act 46 is trying to do. Um, and there are basically three options more or less for Calus right now. One is the uh, what's called the preferred model in Act 46, which is we merge with the other districts in our supervisory union to form one board, one district, one budget, and um, move forward that way. Um, the other option is an alternative governance structure. Um, an alternative governance structure is defined as a supervisory union, so we are Washington Central Supervisory Union, with separate member districts who have separate school boards, um, and then there are certain requirements that you have to meet to qualify as an alternative governance structure. Um, so you have to meet the goals of Act 46, of course, um, you have to show that you have the smallest number of districts practicable within your SU. Um, and you have to show that you are working together in the supervisory union to um, provide the best education for students from pre-K through 12. Um, so those are the major... And the third one. And the third one option. Stay what we are. And the third... Well, that is basically staying how we are. Mm -hmm. We are a supervisory union. We do work together um, with the other towns in our SU, and we have our separate districts for our separate schools, uh, town schools. Well, I think with the alternative structure, we have to show that we've done something more, more than we're doing now right, so to ensure equity and uh, meeting the goals. Right. Um, and then another option that people have brought up is if we were to merge with Montpelier or other neighboring <coughs> districts and do something totally out of the box. Um, right now, Montpelier cannot talk to us about merging because they're in the middle of a merger with Roxbury, so they're like legally not allowed to talk to us about um, merging. But that's something that both towns, both Montpelier and towns within RSU have talked about in the past. Um, so. There, there are various options open to us. There are roadblocks with each of those options. There are different pros and cons. Um, so we would love to hear from you of specific questions and comments and your opinion about what you think about this whole question, where we're going. 
I'm Betsy Para. Um, can I jump to um, the possibility of merging with Montpelier? I was at that meeting last week. Oh, there were about 25 people there. Half of them were from Montpelier and half were from, from the five towns. All the five towns are represented. Um, people at the meeting seem to have a really good idea of what the situation is. They, you know, they realize perfectly well that Washington Central towns cannot approach them yet. Um, do we know if our, if, just suppose, I know I'm really kind of jumping ahead and the meeting will probably go in another direction, but are we allowed, would we be allowed to merge with Montpelier Roxbury if, if, suppose they're, suppose they merge as they, suppose they, both Montpelier and Roxbury vote to merge. They are a particular type of district, which Washington Central is not. The the kind of district that Callis is could, in, in terms of what Act 32 says you must do, can Callis merge with, could Callis merge with them based well, on the you, types of districts? Callis alone? Is that, is that what you might, the question you might raise? Mm -hmm. That would be really complicated because we are already legally part of um, a unified school district. You know, we, we have the unified high school. And so we are legally part of that. Right. We would have to withdraw from the unified high school if we wanted to go our own way, I think. Chantel, yeah. all of those towns in the whole SU would have to vote yes to allow us to exit the supervisory union, and then we could talk to other groups. We By town have. vote or board By vote? By town vote. Uh, but the other thing, too, is we need no, maybe we don't. I was going to say, I think we need to be a pre-K through 12 to merge because we don't, it would be com very complicated for just Callis mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, Roxbury is a, what, a K through 8? Yeah, it's yeah. not a K through 12. Right. So but they, have, they weren't part of anything else. But they have a choice. What's that? Right. I don't believe they were part of anything else. Right, we're part of that. Um, okay. And we we actually talked to, to Roxbury. We we went down, we had a subcommittee, and I was on it, and we went down and we talked to Roxbury about um, bringing them into our SU because they're they're just like our our um, elementary schools, they're pre-K to 6. Well, they're not pre-K 8, they're pre-K 6. Pre-K 6. So they are like us. They are like us, but the distance mm -hmm. just made it really difficult. Mm -hmm. So sure. we decided as a committee not to go there. It was a good point anyway because we didn't merge in. Bob Killier came to these conversations early on, and they, they, they when the, when they had the Center Speed Committee, which was looking at the preferred model, and they basically said, we won't merge with you, you know, we won't give up our sovereignty of our local mm -hmm. board, which is what you have to do in the, in, under the preferred mm -hmm. model. And, you know, they were refused to do that, and the population cutoffs for such that Montpelier is not in a situation where they have to do that in this. We, unfortunately, the supervisory union are. So they, ultimately what's happening here, you know, we've been through reviewing the 706B model, or the preferred model, which is what that committee is set up for, and that's what the state wants everybody to do, really. And now we are on our end to figure out an alternative that meets the law, and then it can or if the secretary, secretary so chooses, they can impose, they can impose a, uh, a kind of unification on us, you know, which I find absolutely offensive and wrong because the goals of this don't, we're not going to gain anything by this, but it, uh, you know, I think as a community, this is where, I mean, I'm not sure what plan we can come up with which will actually meet their criteria which they established, which are almost impossible to meet. And uh, I think, you know, it's going to come down to a push and shove of the public pushing on their politicians and saying, you better not do this to us or we're going to kick your butts out into the street. Sean, I don't mean to be so um, that's what it is. Through my accident, the first meeting was scheduled when Chantel could not be here and I was very sad about that. I really think it was a huge mistake on my part. So I, Chantel was involved in our local Act 46 committee meetings for a year and a half or almost two years. And if she would like to 
tell about that experience or whatever, uh, I'd like her to have a chance to do that. Um, or whatever you want to talk about, but I think you should have the floor to explain what you experienced and where you're, where you're coming from, what you think is important. Okay. Um, well, I haven't prepared anything because there's just too much. <laughs> I thought about preparing it, was just too, it was just too much information. So, um, just a little background, you know, when this first started, before it became an act, and it was just H5, 13, 31, 13, something like that, um, I was writing the letters, stop, slow down, this is too fast, and, you know, doing the, fighting the good fight to try to get them to stop, and, and it didn't. And so I got on a, not the official, what they called the study committee, but I got on a, they we called it a research group or something. It was kind of a pre-study committee committee mm -hmm. because I really wanted to take part in trying to learn as much as I could about it. Um, so that started at the beginning of the summer a couple of years ago. Um, and then I moved on to being on the committee. And I didn't really miss too many meetings. So I was there a lot. And um, I do remember a lot of stuff. So if you have any questions about what has been done, I can probably answer them um, because I, I was there. Um, and one thing about Montpelier that was very clear, the, the Montpelier question keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. And we did try. We went to Montpelier. We talked to Montpelier. We, they sent a member of their, um, their school board to our meeting. And what they said very, very clearly was, we have decided that we want to talk to you about merging together, but we will not talk to your SU until you have merged. They were very clear about that. There was no question about when and how they would speak to us about merging and, and coming together. They wanted to see us come together first. They wanted to see us working well together. And if they couldn't see us working mm -hmm. well together, they were not interested in working with us. They also stated they wouldn't give up their board control. I was at that meeting, too. I listened very carefully to that. That was a condition. They weren't in a position where they had to do this. You know, that, uh, Van Cummings managed to get those numbers. They were originally the cutoff was supposed to be 1,200, and it was lowered, I believe, to 900 because Montpelier was just over 900 in the population. It basically pulled them out of the mix of mandatory consolidation. So, yeah, they did would not give up their local control, which is what this is about as well. I mean, that's what we face here. <coughs> So I guess to continue, um, there is a lot of stuff to talk about, and, and I think I wanted to, I really would like to answer questions about, about what our choices were and choices that were made, if I can remember my computer said I was going to be able to, I was going to try to pull up stuff in case I couldn't remember, but I didn't charge it. Um, so if there are any questions about things, the way things went, I can tell you from my perspective. I know Rick was there a lot, and he has a very different perspective for me, so I think sometimes we remember things a little bit differently. Um, so you can hear both of our perspectives. Well, is there is there any process available to keep local control? I couldn't yes. hear you, sir. I said, is there any, is there any process available to keep local control? Well, yeah, there is a, the, where we are now is because our act, there's, there's all kind of very strict legally stuff that has to do with this Act 46, but if you formed what they are, formal Act 46 study committee, which our district did, and they worked and worked and worked to try to come to an agreement on some kind of a merger, and they could not do it, and so they disbanded. So now the ball is in the court of all the five towns to decide, and that's why we're having this community meeting. Um, East Montpelier has had a couple. Berlin is having one tonight. Uh, Romney has had two. <coughs> Worcester's had one, a very good one I was at, and they're having another one on June 13th. And the idea is for us to uh, basically educate and get as much as we can. There's a lot of information. but So the community knows what their options are, and then we 
have to form some kind of a committee. It is not, um, it does not have to be board members. It can be uh, community members. It should be a, a lot of community members in my estimation. And actually, I think that um, we're allowed to, all the towns in this particular instance will have the same, can have the same number of representatives at, mm -hmm. in that committee. It's not based on population. And that committee would work hard to get an alternative governance structure, that's what, they're, what most places are calling it, mm -hmm. prepared to give to the state sometime after October 1st. They don't even want to see it till after October 1st. We will have to have it in by June 30th, possibly sooner. If they get their rules that they're making done, it will be six months after the rules are done, but it looks like June, th January 30th January will, 30th, be the, June. will be the date that we have to get something done by. A lot of the background work has been done by the committee that Chantel was on, has collected a tremendous amount of data that we will need in order to uh, promote that, um, that alternative governance thing. But there's still work to be done. I mean, some of these reports run into 100 pages, and so not, it has to be done correctly. It has to be vetted, more or less, by a lawyer that understands education law. Um, one of the, it was a subcommittee for alternative structures on the main study committee. And one person who was um, not an official study committee member, but he was with that, he um, pretty much, with everybody talking, wrote a good, what we call a federated union model. But that has some, his ideas were good, but that there's some state statutes that it doesn't quite follow. So that has to be kind of tweaked somehow. I just heard today that there's a district, I think it's Windsor South, somewhere mm -hmm. down in there, that they also have written an alternative governance plan, which seems to overcome the, some of our problems. So we can look at that. But there, there are 89 or more towns who have rejected or not even had committees wow. to meet about Act 46 merging. You'll read in the paper, oh, 105 towns have merged. Well, mm -hmm. not really, because counted in those 105 towns is Mount Pillar, which didn't merge with anything, and Burlington and South Burlington. Those, mm -hmm. well, South Burlington, no, not South Burlington. Anyway. Those ones are part of the 105 who merged, but they really didn't do much. So almost half the state is not happy. And those people have gotten together on a regular basis now, and there was a meeting in Westminster a couple of weeks ago that I went to, and I can provide you with a video of that, where um, I can't remember how many people were there, at, at least 50 or 60, and we had a panel, and people were telling their problems and how they fixed it. And, and so forth. So it's a true. It's not just these five towns that are saying we don't like it. It's over a hundred, or not over a hundred. Excuse me, over eighty or so. In fact, yesterday uh, there was a vote in Ludlow mm -hmm. where they voted down uh, a merger plan for so Black River can keep their high school. Mm -hmm. um, I have been reading online a lot about. There's um, Danville, Twinfield, and Cabot were supposed to be merging. I guess there's going to be a vote. There's a lot of distress in Cabot, and they're looking to merge with somebody. <coughs> Perhaps Twinfield might be looking to merge with somebody. I mean, there are options out there thinking out of the box. We don't have to just, I'd like to stick with our five towns, but if, if it would help us and help somebody else, I'd be willing to go with an idea with another town like that. But I think uh, I just want to keep everything as open as possible, and then we can narrow it down to see what's best for us. I mean, that's my opinion. Um, the other reason we're having these meetings is part of the stuff we have to show the state 
is that we met with the community and the community wants to do, mm -hmm. is help wanting us to do this. So that's the reason. We're also going to be sending out, or by Survey Monkey a survey, so we can have that to show the state, yes, we've gone to the people, we've tried to get their opinion. And so that's why we wanted to talk. I wish we had the slides, because it does <laughs> engender questions. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are, uh, I honestly believe there are ways to do this. Some people say, no, you, you have to have one board for everything. But when you look at just two board members from Callis amongst 11 people in it, it's really hard to see how we would have much of a say in what actually happened to this school. And when you go to these schools, um, at the last meeting, one of the teachers was at the meeting and said that they had spent all afternoon, all the teachers, going over each child in the school and where was the best placement for that child. Now that's a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I, 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 I won't say it can't happen with one board, but it's, it's just, in my feeling, it's just a feeling for your building and your, mm -hmm. these, these particular kids. And yes, we want to do, we want the best for all the kids in the district, but it's kind of like putting your arms around them in one building and doing it that way. And I, I, I would be, I just think that having our own building that we worked so hard to build. And I don't know how many of you were here in 1968 when Karen Valentine, no, Carolyn Valentine stood up at town meeting. I'll never forget it. It was my first town meeting. <laughs> and in that old chandelier that was hanging over her head, and she said, it was just the very end of the meeting. Everybody was sort of getting up out of their seats to go, and Carolyn stood up and said, what are we going to do about our schools? Because <laughs> then East Callis, North mm -hmm. Callis has since burned down, and Maple mm -hmm. Corner were our schools. And Later on, before we got this one built, we lived in Kent's Corner. And when our son was in first grade, he took a bus from Kent's Corner to the Armstrong Farm, got on another bus, and then went to the East Callis School for first grade. It was great for him, because he had that long ride coming home, and he took a nap. <laughs> I was not ready for that kid when he came home. And, and we didn't complain, that's the way it was, but it sure was nice to have them all going to one building. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of us feel very close to this particular building or site. I have a two-part question. Um, going back, so current parent um, you say your in the name school, Maggie when you Weiss. Speak. Thank you. Um, so going back to the five goals or expectations mm -hmm. um, of the act itself, what are we not meeting? currently where 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 is there a need for well the equity one change? the equity one is almost no schools seem to meet it like equity in say. what sense and, well and that's the problem can i speak to that yes you can speak yeah. to that so it's a well known thing fact i guess that there are many teachers at u32 that will say that in the first week of school they can tell you what school a student comes from by what they can't do. Hmm. And that's huge. That's not right. We have kids coming out of sixth grade at five different schools in the same supervisory union that are not getting equal. And equal does not mean the same, mm -hmm. but equal educations. They're getting to U32. Some are at a huge disadvantage in certain ways. And that's, that's just within our supervisory union. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine what it looks like looking down with a bird's eye view from the state? Mm -hmm. So that's part of the problem. So that's okay. the equity piece. Okay. Yeah. Well, another part of that equity problem, and, and I've taught at East Montpelier for 20 years, and ever since the beginning of time, the teachers have always made that comment. And when you understand that a tremendous percentage of the kids in Worcester and, and a good percentage from Callis, I don't know the numbers, more, a higher percentage in Worcester and Callis are um, 
get free and reduced price lunch, which means that they are, I guess, not at the poverty level, but they certainly have a lot of needs. So when you look at that part of it, you can understand that those kids are going to need a lot more propping up in order to even get over to U32. Mm, I think that that's a socioeconomic position, and I don't think that those things necessarily are associated. You can be low income and have a high level of education and support at home, but uh, well, I think you can. Support. But uh, I'm just, I just saying, think it's a over, dangerous over, statement to make. Over over the United States, I mean, this is yeah. a given problem, and we yeah. and the, you know that you need more help when you have more of that group of people in your building. That's not to say 100 percent of them can't learn. It doesn't mean anybody can't learn. It's just for some of them, it takes longer. And um, but the problem with the equity, meeting the equity, is that there is no standard. No one has defined when you have met equity. And so it's really, really hard. And all the towns are working very, very hard to make sure that every child has gone as far as they can help them go before they head off to U32. Yeah. I have a question. If the these disadvantaged children and the other children all started kindergarten together, then who do we blame for their failure? The it, school well, system? No, no, it's just that you have to understand that every child does not, and I don't care whether they're social economically deprived or at the top of the heap, children do not mature and, and uh, grow at the same rate as every other child. I saw it in my own family. Our youngest son was not ready for high school. He somehow got through. And he wasn't going to be able to do anything as far as they thought. He now, oh, and he wouldn't know how to do any math. And he ended up on the dean's list and calculus in college and owned his own business. So he wasn't ready like my other two kids. And this is true of every single kid. You can start them all on the same day they have the same birthday. They are not going to learn at the same rate. Chantel? Um, so I'd like to continue to speak to that. Um, so I think with Act 46, what they're really referring to, more than socioeconomic, more than anything else, is the fact that as a board in Calus, we can vote to support a particular support system mm -hmm. for the students, where maybe the board in Berlin chooses not to do that. So here at Calus, for instance, we decided to um, hire a half-time mm -hmm. math interventionist. What they have found is that it takes something like, don't quote me, please, I know this is going on film and everything, but there's <laughs> something close to this. 57 times more time is put into a student who needs remediation in math mm -hmm. when they hit um, middle school, mm -hmm. I think it is, mm -hmm. than if you catch it in kindergarten and start working with them then. 57 mm -hmm. times more time. Time is money. So if we can come together as a board and say, this is what we are committed to. We are committed to catching those kids early on and giving them the remediation, the intervention is what they call it, the intervention that they need, the one-on-one -on -one help, and boost them up and get them where they need to be by second grade, and then send them off on their way, and now they're fine then that's a huge thing to be able to do. And so now I'm going to bet that at Calus, in about three years, they're going to start to see inequities mm -hmm. at U32 in seventh grade in that Calus is probably going to be beyond the other, some of the other elementary schools that have not chosen to get an interventionist in math when they hit seventh grade. That's just a guess. Again, don't quote me on that. I'm just surmising, and it's, it's a hypothesis, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm going to be proven correct because it has been proven that getting those interventionists early has, has a huge impact on kids' levels when they reach, reach sixth, seventh grade. So this is what we're talking about with equity. What does the board choose to do? What do we choose to invest our money in for the kids at our school compared to some of the other schools? <clears throat> and are we doing it the same? Right. No, we're not. <coughs> I would argue, you know. Rick, can I just jump in for one second? 
Um, just that being on the board too, I think a lot of our ideas around this come from our superintendent and our principals. Right. And so the amazing thing about, the, the nice thing about the situation that we are actually in to me is that um, we do work together. Mm -hmm. I mean, our superintendent is really big on trying to create equity within the right. SU. Um, we've already created a common set of learning outcomes, so every single one of our six schools has, mm -hmm. these are our learning outcomes and they're the same for all five elementary schools and for U32. And they have um, a math coach that they all share who works mm -hmm. with the teachers across all of the schools. They do trainings together, they do professional development together. So. I think we already we're we're doing these things that Act Forty Six would want us to do mm -hmm. of working together, and we can do it in our current configuration. I believe, mm -hmm. um, but I think keeping our current configuration means that we at Callis can say this is our priority right now, and we can afford to hire this math, math interventionist. This is our serious priority, and we don't know if maybe at another school in the SU. They would love to be able to do that, but they have this other urgent priority that they can't, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think if when you have the separate boards for each elementary school, they can see the picture of their school, but they also can see the bigger picture mm -hmm. because they're part of the SU. We go to larger SU-wide meetings. We have a superintendent in common who's filling us in on the bigger picture. Um, and I agree, we have a long way to go to get to the point where our kids all get to U32 and they're able to achieve equally and the teachers have no idea which elementary school they came from. But I think our SU is trying to do that right now as a group. John? I just kind of pick it up on what Chantel said and also what was just said. Um, couldn't the op we have the opposite effect? Couldn't we have, if we had just one board at U32, the benefit, what do you, would you call that person, early intervention? Intervention. Mm -hmm. On math? So we're able to do that now. What if this universal board, do one way with our local board, said no? Mm -hmm. And we could actually lose what we're having now too. I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that that's, not, that's, I mean that might be a, an equitable outcome too. Um, if we're talking about equity, there can be equity by reducing what we're providing our children. And we would have less say right now. We, we have the right, as I understand it, to say, this is what we're doing for our, ele our elementary school as long as we meet the minimums. But we can go above and beyond. But with this universal board, they could say, well, that was a nice program while you had it. I'm glad it worked well for you, but we're not doing it anymore. It's not in the budget. Um, I don't, so John, it could work both ways. Why they would do that, because they're a board for, at that point, it would be a board for K through 12. And if they are shown the data that, well, you're going to have to get them proficient at some point, so would you like to spend 57 times more money in seventh grade than in kindergarten? That, that no, no, it makes make sense, but I, sense. Then, then I don't know why all the elementary schools are not doing that now. Mm -hmm. So, so the, whatever the logic is that's driving the other elementary schools to not provide the same very sound mm -hmm. program, those people are now going to be have their individual reps up there speaking to what some other priority is, and they're going to say, you know, it's going to be the majority vote. Um, and that's a and weighted it, majority. And that doesn't make sense, Chantel, but they could do that. But it, it happened at U32 15 years ago when our son was there. They had one math program for all 7th and 8th graders. It was the same math program. And I was on the parent advisory committee for 7th and 8th grade, and it took years to get them to expand. They had the one math program that all the kids could do, and they didn't have anything else. Well, let me tell you, when I was a teacher in, at East Montpelier and I had an outstanding class of 10 kids that year, and I went to U32, and this was before they changed it, I guess, and said, you need to do something for this bunch of kids, because they had already done pre-algebra. And uh, they said, no, they're all going to take the same thing. I, oh, I, I went to our our U32 school rep, and he had the audacity to tell me he, he would have to talk to the professionals. And I kind of wondered, since I was a licensed teacher, who he thought he was going to talk to. But anyway, <laughs> in the end, the U32, they, not just U32, I don't want to blame U32. The high schools know that when parents get upset about something, 
that they kind of stonewall them and then those kids go to the next grade or the next level and that complaint goes away. U32 is not the only place that does that. I think it's just a general way that some public institutions have dealing with discontent. I started to talk about doing something separately and, uh, and paying for it separately outside of school. And next thing I knew, one of the teachers at U32, math teachers, had taken on three kids on her own time, not getting paid for it, and doing a separate math class with three students in it. So and then they we changed need to, it after We need that. to talk about what we want for Calus. I, I need to know, I guess, how important it is for Calus people to have their own board, their own, for me to know that, um, and their own uh, budget. Um, I think with an alternative governance structure, we wouldn't necessarily have the same complete budgets. In fact, right now, some of you may not know this, and it's not under the table, but it is happening. The transportation is now covered by the supervisory union. They have a software program that tells them the best bus routes and where to pick people up and mm -hmm. so forth. That's all one contract. And the same way with special ed, um, that's all driven through the special, through the supervisory union, which makes complete sense. Every building needs special education, and they can send them out to where they're needed. And I think that's great. And there can be other things. Um, but I, I just want to keep some of, of our decisions here, our decisions for our own teachers and our own principal, um, and, and those kinds of things. Can I get another question? Importantly, I think you've got to keep the community in the decision making. I mean, when I've spent six years as vice chair of the board here, too. And we had close to, if not 100% student parent uh, participation in this school. And it's, there's no small wonder. I mean, Callis is not a wealthy town. You look at the cross section of what people make here, we're not wealthy. And yet we put out some of the best students in this district, many of them, and consistent you know, flyers. And people come here to this community because of that school. And I would credit a tremendous amount to that community ownership in this school and their participation. And I've been at all those town meetings, school boards, over the year. I've had to be in front of the townspeople many times. I've been on the other side. And things are, you know, they really are thought out well. People take great pride in it. There isn't huge turnout because everybody feels like there isn't a lot of control. However, I'll say this, when contentious issues came up, we would have people come out of the woodwork, which is a great thing. That's what they do, and that's what their local governance does. This model basically eliminates that. It creates a, a board that is representative based on population. So certain, the large towns will really control this board. Two towns would control it. And their interests are different from ours. But the real worry, I mean, we've been working together as communities for a long time, and we've done it successfully in this supervisory unit. What worries me, though, is that we'll get a lot more disengagement in the communities and the schools, and that's going to have a tremendous negative impact on performance of the kids. And I also think that there are going to be financial interests over time that are going to begin to govern what happens to the smaller schools who do not have the voting blocks, because it's going to be the financial advantage of the other towns. And I'm sorry people do this. You know, and I think we, we and Webster particularly, are going to be on the losing side of that. And our kids are going to be on the losing side. So. Maggie, did you have another question? Um, I'm just looking for some clarification because my, I thought that when, even though the board um, and the teachers may be interested in desiring a new position, but that still needs approval from the superintendent, doesn't it? So we, we already have an oversight. If you want to create a new position, does, doesn't the central office have some involvement in that? A new position? In For the example, the, the uh, math specialist. Yeah. Didn't, that, didn't Bill Kimball have to be consulted on that and approve that? There's no involvement from the central office already over what our school 
may or may not do in terms of creating new positions. The hiring happens through central office, yeah, doesn't it? And he approves it. Yeah. And we also have a director of curriculum. Correct. So we have these pre-existing structures that support both the elementary schools, all five of them, and then a combined representative board for U32 of all five towns. Right. Again, with central office supervision and support that looks at each of our individual communities' needs, which are individualized and different based on so many different things, um, location included. You know, what Worcester or Middlesex needs may be very different than what Callis needs um, on so many different levels. So I guess I'm, I, in looking at anything other than the alternative model, I'm still trying to understand what, what would be the benefit? Why would we mm -hmm. want to have one board yeah, totally when we already have all these wonderful things in place that have made our school district, U32 district, successful thus far? What I've heard, um, I think Chantal could speak to this probably better than I could. Do you want her? No. But I've really. heard, the <laughs> argument I've heard for consolidation is if we could envision a future in which all the residents of our five towns were responsible for all the children of our five towns and our borders were broken down and, sorry, I don't mean to make this sound ridiculous because this, this is a real thing. That, um, we care about all the children in all these towns equally, and we show that by having one board where we are represented, where we, where we really take care of each other's kids starting in pre-K instead of starting in seventh grade. Because we already do that in, from seven through 12, you know, at U32. But to say, let's go all the way back to pre-K, and right from the beginning of our children's education, look out for each other across the towns, and not just work as hard as we can as an SU to make things equal, but really and truly just be one, you know, big district that we are taking care of these kids together. And I, I That's guess kind I, of what I, it looks like. I, I guess I can add to that. I, sorry, I was being a little glib when I said no, but you sounded like you had an idea of way to start, and that was a good way to start. Just that's kind of a, that's kind of the theoretical kind of big picture feeling of it, right? But in a more like listing ways that it could benefit. Um, just some ideas, and I'm, there, there's lots more. But mm -hmm. one really big one is that we are currently um, six separate employers. We're six businesses, however you want to think of us. Actually, it's one. Well, there's U32 as well. Oh, yeah, but that's not counted as school district. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're all treated as different employers. So if we were one district with one board and one budget, we would be one employer. So for instance, when we just had to hire an art teacher, mm -hmm. we, wanted, we needed a point four art teacher, East Montpelier needed the point mm -hmm. five. We, we had to hire for two jobs mm -hmm. with two sets of benefits. Mm -hmm. Luckily we found somebody who was willing to jump through those hoops, great. Um, there are lots of examples of this. In order to get, to be able to meet the needs of all these tiny schools that we have, we have to have lots of part-time people. Those part-time people, it's hard to find good people that want to work part-time. Not a lot of people can afford to just work part-time. And so they have to go around piecing together jobs. If we were one district and one employer, we would have a leg up on other districts in terms of hiring better people. So that's, and it would be, it would just be simpler because for, for everybody all concerned. I mean, these people are getting, they have two sets of benefit packages mm -hmm. that they have to package, to put, they have to piece together. They get two different paychecks, if you can imagine. Like, what the, anyway. Um, so then there's other things like, if, if say our, one of our schools gets too small and we need to start looking at closing it, and I'm not gonna name schools, but say there's a school that, it just gets to that point, and it's, you know, there's 30 kids there, and it's just ridiculously expensive to educate them, those 30 kids in this tiny little school, wherever it may be. So we end up having to close that school, but we have this building, and we come up with this great idea of having um, a school that we can, that anybody in the, dist, in the whole SU, which would be a district at that point, could go to. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a tech school. It could be um, a, la a bilingual school. It could be, you name it. Mm -hmm. We could be creative. We could make a magnet school. Mm -hmm. They're already doing it in um, uh, Shittenden East, I think it is. They're already starting to create um, one of those kind of magnet schools. The boundaries could, could disappear between the schools. So say this, t this tiny little school of Cal's doesn't work for one of my kids. She's just not happy here for whatever reason. She could go to East Montpelier. No big deal. We're all one district. So she could, she could go there. And they might have students that our small school would work better for them. Or maybe we have somebody working here who specializes in working with dyslexic kids. And there's somebody over in Worcester who is dyslexic. Send them here. It's cheaper than having a specialist there and a specialist here. We could just have the specialist here and bus those kids here. So there's a lot of things that could happen by being one employer and one district. Oh, and things that we haven't even thought of yet. There, you, there, it, the sky's the limit, mm -hmm. really, with the ideas that we could come up with. So if there's a public will for it, John. If there's a public will for it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. If I may, it seems to me, and, and I'm not as fully informed as board members are, but it seems to me that so many of the, the impediments to this collaboration, it seems, are, are self-imposed and that yes. we could arrive at many of these same outcomes while preserving our local boards and maybe achieve them in a better way by breaking down some of those barriers while maintaining our individuality. If, if a community, and let's just say Worcester, I keep hearing Worcester, I heard a a Vermont school board, that's what's board of education person saying, well, Worcester's going to close. That's just the way it is. I'm not using the name because I don't want the guy firebombed. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, if, if they, this, that community decided they, they, they couldn't keep going, it didn't make sense, or right now it didn't make sense because their population is right, what's wrong with all the communities that are members of the district getting together and saying, let's, let's formulate somewhat one of these approaches. There's, there's nothing that, that prevents that. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I was on, involved in union bargaining for almost 25 years, and I chair a bargaining team. And we did this thing. There were different bargaining units that statutorily were individual and legally unto themselves separate entities like our districts, our schools, I'm sorry. It's our districts. And, yeah, our little mini school districts. Mm -hmm. And what we did was, with, with the, when, when bargaining with the state, was on, on issues that we had in common across all the bargaining units, we bargained them collectively. We had an MOU that we arrived up upon between all the bargaining units, which these, these individual school, uh, town schools could do the same, boards could do the same thing. You arrive at an MOU and you say, we're going to appoint representatives from each of our boards and we're going to have a master bargaining team with these teachers. And, and what we're going to bargain are, and you decide what's on that, but like benefits, like Chantel brought up a good point. It makes no sense to have, I don't know how you even do that. Well, how you have we do that. We different have, health. We have we one, bargain, one unit now, we have John. one contract. And we just, bargain the health benefits together. Oh, you do it now? Yeah, Cross, all, all right, so, so you're already so on that path. Yeah. And these now, things can be North, done. North Country yeah. Union has 14 towns. And they do, they have all kinds of part-time people who go from one town to another and, mm -hmm. and somehow they, they are able to do it. Mm -hmm. And they, there are a lot of places like that where these ideas that we have and that Chantel have, which are good ideas, but can be met by having individual school boards mm -hmm. because people are already doing it. And I talked to John Castle about, well, how do you do this? He said, oh, you just do da da da. Mm -hmm. Well, then, when we just hired an art teacher with East Montpelier, it turns out that's exactly what Bill Kimball did, just what John Castle at North Country told me was the way you could do it. Yeah, um, I learned a long time ago that easy isn't always better. And I know that. For the people, for this art teacher who's now going to get two checks and has to juggle her health insurance, however, you know, all of us has gone through a time in life where we had to kind of juggle something to make it work. And making sure it's easy for 100% of the people 
isn't necessarily the best path, I believe, for everybody. And I just really think that um, having uh, our own school board. The other thing to consider when you're talking about one board that takes in all the buildings, they take in all the grounds. They make the rules for what, how the grounds are going to be used, what, what hoops you have to jump through in order to use this building or that building or this play yard or whatever. So while that might, but another thing that's good about our supervisory union that they are now doing is that they are kind of organizing the custodians. And you may know that Berlin is doing a big construction job this summer. So they can't clean their school all summer long. They gotta wait till the end. So someone came up with the idea of the custodians will get together and they'll clean Callis and they'll clean Worcester and they'll clean East Montpelier and they'll clean Romney. And then the last two weeks, they'll just kill off <laughs> Berlin yeah. and it'll get done. Well, those are the kinds of things that are happening now and they can continue to happen. It makes me really happy to hear that going on. And I think we can make it work. It, I think, I know we have enough bright people in our town and the five towns to be able to make those things work. Oh, we got a hand in the back. Could you identify yourself? Oh, Heather Scandale. Okay. I've been in and out, so I don't know if this is answered, but I heard a little bit. But a lot of times I'm hearing about like what's best for the kids. I think that was a theme uh -huh. this committee is working with in the board. So I'm just curious, like, I know Chantel had mentioned a little bit about the part-time jobs, which I've heard in the past, but I don't know if there's that much data to back that generalization of that up, because I don't, I don't feel that way in our school that that's necessarily true, or other small schools, like I think that they have really good educators even though they're part-time. And I don't know if there's data to show that that's actually accurate to, you know, or it's just based on a generalization. So my other question, I guess my question is, what other benefits would consolidation bring for kids? I didn't know if that was, was that asked before? Because if it was, I don't want to, don't, that, don't I think that goes back. It. No. We have I'm a just question. wondering for the kids, what other benefit other than, I can see like, but I don't know if, I guess my concern is, is that going to be really solidified in a contract where kids are going to be able to access different schools, or is that just like well, just something we can... Yeah. My first thing when accessing different schools, and while I like the idea, the miles on buses or by cars right. to transport them is really um, inhibits it very much. I mean. I've lived about as far away from this school as you can get, which is seven or eight miles. You know, supposing mm -hmm. somebody from Northeast Callis wanted to go to Worcester, I think that's great, but it's a heck of a long drive. I mean, I feel sorry for the people who live on that little road, in, I think it's called du Duber Road, or up on the hill in Worcester. That's in Callis. Gotta get all the way over here. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be a drag on kids and parents and, and everybody. And yeah. one thing that I have been adamant about is that any kind of transportation thing where um, any children are take longer to get home. I'm saying not just the bus ride, but when I was a teacher, there were times when kids had to wait in the building for the bus to come back for them. Mm -hmm. And so for them, it was 45 minutes before they got home. How fair was that to the kids who were on the first bus? So those are the kinds of things I'm looking to keep um, good for our, our kids. Mm -hmm. But I don't know the answer to how it would be better for the education. Jerry? I, well, I, um, my big question is, you know, if we merge with a whole bunch more, Districts, big, it makes the school bigger. Now, <clears throat> we have children that need special needs, 
Are they going to get that just to, because of the bigger school? Or are they going to be kind of set aside and do whatever they can do and hope and pray for the best? That's one thing that bothers me. Another thing that bothers me is I do not want to see this district go with the law at 46. I want this school to stay as a, as a school. I, and I don't like the idea that you're going to have one school board and only two people from this town are going to be there. It's not fair. It's not fair. And I, I, I've read a lot about Act 46. I don't like any part of it. No part at all. I don't think it's any good for anyone. Not the children, not the parents, and not people like me, for sure. And um, I just... I would like to see, get our heads together and come up with an alternate plan so we can keep our schools, we can keep our five district school and hope and pray to God that they'll accept it. I, I, I thought that was a dumb thing that they put together the legislature to begin with. It's not helping the children. I don't think it's going to happen to help to help the children. I mean, they're going to be longer getting to one school or shorter, <laughs> whatever. The little guys, they're going to be tired. And, you know, they keep saying every child needs to have at least nine hours of sleep at night. <laughs> well, you know, if you're riding a bus for an hour, to get to school and then get home, you're not going to have that time. And the child is going to be tired, and they're going to—they're not going to do that well in school because they're going to be tired, and especially the little ones, and some of the older ones. In fact, I mean, you and Jerry too. I've seen—I've been into that school before when my kids was going there, and the kids were sound asleep. <laughs> I don't know if it, I, it wasn't because long distance traveling, I don't think. It's because it stayed up too late at night. <laughs> but anyway, that's my opinion, and I'm not going to say any more. But um, I, I don't like that Act 46. Geraldine, can I just speak to that? There, nothing will change about the schools or transportation. You, no, nothing would change at all. Just the school board would change. Well, how do you know that? Yeah. Well, the goal of Act 46 is not to change to close schools at all. In fact, it says right in the law that schools cannot close in the first four years. But after that, it is, I guarantee you, it will be. They can say a lot, but the the they, 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 then they turn around and change everything too. I don't trust yeah. those people down there. I'm not saying that is true. Rick. I would tell you, you know, Scott Thompson and I sat up when I, before we were fighting this before Act 46 was Act 46. We went in and, a, you know, we testified in front of the House. And I said to that committee, and I know the chair very well, I worked with him for seven years on transportation planning. And I said, be careful. You know, Maine did this in 2008, and it's been a disaster. Mm -hmm. And we're walking into the same trap. I said, consolidation is not a bad thing. If it's driven by the community, I said, you make sure you enable, do not mandate. And they went and they mandated. They created basically a preferred model that is really, in all of the fancy language, it funnels you down in the restrictions to where you have to do that. And if you don't do that, they impose it. And so I think, you know, what we end up as a community, I think we do have to come up with an alternative. And I don't care if it even really meets all those criteria. What really matters is ultimately that the community at large gets out there and refuses. This is what happened in Maine, and let me tell you, they changed that changed that politic. They since that time, 42%, and this is the last time I looked, which was a few years ago, 42% of towns that were forced to consolidate have are either in the process of or have withdrawn. Because it costs more. I called these towns, people, and, and they said accountability went to zero, costs spiraled upward, and 
there was basically community ownership in the schools just disintegrated. There was no longer, I mean, it's a major hub for small communities. You know, it works great in the Chittenden counties of the world. They don't, the school is one little piece of a bigger social economy. You get in these small communities, and it's a huge binder. And so, you know, we, the impact is very, very different. So I think really what this comes down to, it's not just about coming up with alternatives here. What the real push is in this is when it comes down to Rebecca Holcomb and company accepting or not accepting an alternative, the taxpayers, we support them, we pay for these schools, we built this school, and it will be given to that union for one dollar, boom. And yeah, when it's when it's they can't when they're done that. with it, they will give it back for a dollar. You know what? By that point, it's used up. They will have done done they'll defer maintenance because say, well, we're going to close it. So we'll be stuck with a husk of a building that we're going to have to put a lot of money into just yeah, to make it sellable. And that's what will happen. I manage buildings. I know this. So they got, you know, this is what really irritates me. Did they enable or did they mandate? And they mandated here, and it's wrong. It's going to. So the good news right now, though, is that the legislature has passed Act 49, <laughs> which was a Senate bill and then a House bill, and now it's been passed, and it's Act 49, and it um, includes a little bit more definition of the alternative governance structure, and um, one of the things it says is that if... A group, if a town like ours wants to maintain our separate districts within our supervisory union, one of the reasons we could do that is because there's a significant level, a significant difference in the level of indebtedness between our towns, which is the case here. So East Montpelier, um, I was trying to find the numbers on my email. I have like a thousand emails about this. Um, but right now, does anyone have the numbers in front of them? Matt has it, right? Yep, I do. Uh, East Montpelier, 8.1 million, Middlesex, 3.5, and Dan, 3 million. Uh, East Montpelier, 8.1 million, Middlesex, 3.5 million, and Berlin, 3 million. And so that goes until 1933. And Calus is. So we're talking about. Um, <laughs> Three towns within our SU that hold significant debt right now. The two towns that have no debt are Worcester and Callis. Um, they're also the two towns that have the lowest um, income. So we're talking about the two towns with the least amount of income helping the towns with more income pay off their debt. So it looks like it Sounds looks like me. the legislature has <laughs> given you us a way. Do you? Yeah, it looks like the legislature has given us a way to propose an alternative governance structure and to ask that we be allowed to create this separate plan where we have our own, we maintain our school boards and we move forward toward the goals of Act 46, mm -hmm. um, which Chantel described really well, where we really want to look out for all of our kids, pre-K through 12, we want to look for opportunities wherever they are, we want to make sure that we're working together for a common curriculum and professional development of our teachers um, and um, special education, all of these things. So that's where we are right now. And, and one of the things that we need, that if we decide as a board, which we haven't voted yet as a board, if we decide as a board that that's the way we want to go, one thing we really need is input from the community. We need to be able to tell the Board of Education that we've heard from this many residents of Callis and this is how they feel about this. And so one thing that we really need from all of you is to talk to your friends and your neighbors and your families and encourage them to fill out our survey once we send that out to the community and to contact us with their opinions, um, either whichever way they fall, however they feel about this or if they have questions. Um, because we really need a mass of input that we can say this is what the people of Callis feel and this is what they've told us. So. I feel like I'm open-minded about it, but I don't feel like the selling points are that strong to make me decide something different. Like, I just feel like, you know, the like a single contract, you know, isn't a huge um, game changer for me. And then the, you know, having services, that's not a huge game changer either, because if my child, 
needed serious services, they're going to get that through mm -hmm. the right system we have, 504, mm -hmm. EST, IEP. Like, if they need those services, even if they're dyslexic, they're, they should be, there's an avenue for those, mm -hmm. you know, in public education. So I don't feel like, I'm, I'm here to hear, like, other, like, not just from, I don't want to put her on the, you know, like, other reasons of why, you know, like, why you do it. Like, I just, I'm open to those things. I'm just not, you know, there, I haven't had a lot of evidence to show me, like, that should be. Bill? People that I talk to, this whole issue of bonding and indebtedness, mm -hmm. to me, says it's dead on arrival. Because I don't see our towns adopting the debt that other people have taken okay. on. To me, it, 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 if you want to put it cr crassly, it's taxation without representation. Yeah. We didn't vote for it. We were conservative. We did what we could do that's here right. to take care of our place. Right. And if they wanted to spend $8 million on their building, that's their choice. Mm -hmm. But they are the ones that are bonded for it, not us. And I, I, I just, to me, that, that kills it right there. I, I, I want to speak to that only because that's the first thing I said to somebody was, well, we didn't vote for these bonds. We can't be made to pay them. And they said, oh, well, the way it works is if you decide to go the preferred model, your town actually has to vote yes or no or whatever. And, and by voting yes, it. you're yes. saying yes to that bond. You're consenting to that's it. Right. That's, uh, so oh, so I agree with you totally. You know, so I'm just you saying you don't you don't vote yes. You vote yes with one condition. That's we right. don't accept the bond. Right. But I'm Let saying. Let the state figure that one out. The, the, the state, you know, tried and I kind of pulled, tried to pull the wool over people's eyes yeah. with that one. Yeah. And, well, I, I want to add one other comment. It's um, before we had uh, the school board meeting before town meeting. I went to quite a number of the school board meetings after lunch, mm -hmm. and you went from 400 people to 40 people. Mm -hmm. the, the, budget, the budget never got really discussed. I mean, it was delightful to sit there. And for, for, the, cur <laughs> yeah, right. for, the, for the curmudgeons who started asking questions, there was one basic answer. I'm sorry, that's mandated. We have to do that. These are required. And it just strikes me that the state's the ones put all these requirements on us, and now instead of coming up with a real solution to what's going on, they're trying to consolidate it more so there's more control mm -hmm. from the state level down. Mm -hmm. And there's one that just really irks me, and I don't know whether it's a real advantage to the school or not, but I understand every supervisory union has a curriculum coordinator. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a department at the state level that does curriculum coordination. And I believe that if you want to be licensed as a teacher, you have to have taken courses in curriculum. So there's all this redundancy being dumped on us from up above. Mm -hmm. and, and in a sense, I sort of resent the governor saying, well, if the towns will keep their budgets down, we'll be okay, when in fact it's the state that's costing right. us all this money. Yeah. That's right. And um, just, for you, just for the, I, if some of you may have read it in the paper, that Washington Central Supervisory Union uh, teachers and boards have agreed on a two-year contract. They did it uh, amongst themselves without uh, NEA reps and lawyers and so forth. They decided to focus on, on the uh, health care mm -hmm. or cost and, and uh, <coughs> salaries and they have come to an agreement and it's going to save the teachers and us money. Good good money. So we did it whether Phil Scott wanted us to or not, we did it. And there's no reason why other towns can't do it and meet that. Um, I, I believe the teachers were paying 15% of their health insurance and now they'll be paying 18% and they're changing to a different plan and so forth, but it's it's good for everybody. And how, one of the best how much they're gonna save because they <coughs> voted that compensation for their to pay help them pay their their down payments in oh, their you mean insurance. their co pays and so forth? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it because the premiums themselves are less are a lot less. Mm -hmm. So that saves the town because the town's paying eighty two percent of that. And it does. But it the town is financing the uh, co payments. Yeah. 
That's true, but it, <laughs> so it, I don't know it, if they made any it, money. It, it does. It does <laughs> come. It's hard. It's complicated, but it does yeah, work to everybody's advantage, luckily enough. And and one of the best, I understand, one of the best um, uh, people on that board was from Callis Board. It's very interested in um, in, in the health uh, insurance numbers and so forth, and has worked on it for years and has done a good job and and, and she's done she's really really good. I have a oh, <coughs> question in the back. Just a quick question back on the bonds. Yes. Um, let's just say hypothetically we we you know we acquiesce. We we, uh, we agree to that forty six and we consolidate. Uh, how does future bonds play into that? Let's just say, you know, Berlin decides they want to you know, they, they want a brand new roof. Or we or we need a roof. Okay. So they, let's just say we need a roof. Yeah, the so. thing the the way they people who were for the preferred model expressed it, well you'll be paying for our past bonds, so we will pay for your roof. But I in my personal little mind thought, well, this roof is pretty small and that will add to the whole budget and you know, maybe they would really rather close this little school and not bother to put the roof on it. So so, so there's no guarantee that that another town who needed a bond vote would necessarily get it. Okay, so does that mean that we would vote for the Berlin roof or Berlin would vote on our roof? How, no, we all it would be one budget. One budget. One okay, board, one budget. and they okay. would say we're going to bond for this so we, one. So we, being a smaller school, we would. We have two votes, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, we would go very far. But um, <laughs> and the other thing to remember is that every town, including U32, has what they call a fund balance, which is basically leftover money from the year before that they're allowed to use. It's a huge slush fund. I don't know, it's got to be a million or more in the district, but that, those fund balances also would all go into that one pot. Right. Well, can I say something? The fund balance is actually, what that is, I mean, you do a budget and it's a proposal, it's a projection of your expenses, right. and all, you don't really use it. That is supposed to be there for emergencies, right? That is if you're, you run over, so we don't have to have a town meeting. That's supposed to be untouchable unless right. you something turns up. Like and that's that. happened. That happens, you it know, does happen. you have one yeah. student move in who needs special mm -hmm. services yeah. and you go to your fund balance and that's mm -hmm. where you get the money yeah. to pay for that emergency. Mm -hmm. Whoa, we didn't know this kid was coming here and we need to provide them with this. And You're not supposed to just spend that. It really yeah. rolls forward. It's your, it's your emergency buffer. But it just, uh, just for information, <laughs> that all goes into the pot. Too. It is. It's 5% of your of yeah. a budget or whatever that number is that they did the need for a buffer. Well, I got another idea too. I think maybe we ought to look into becoming an academy, like St. John's Ray. <laughs> They'll accept anybody from overseas and they do a, a wonderful education. And I know a lot of people, well, St. John's Ray people, they don't even have to pay tuition to send their children to them because it's in St. John's And that would be a godsend. <laughs> but they got a big endowment. That, there, there's a lot of money there. Yeah, there's we a lot of money that. there. But, you know, I was reading in the world that there's a school in this area. I don't know. I can't remember. Cabot is looking at, was looking at that idea. That's so, right. Yeah. It was Cabot that would look at the turn it to Big picture, an like, let's become an academy and draw people in. I don't, yeah. it would be a terrible expense, <laughs> terrible to get started, but and then we wouldn't have to be dictated to the government. Yeah, they're working on controlling independent schools now too. So. Yes, they are. <laughs> and I think sure. that's terrific. I'd like to see it happen, personally. Get the, Anything that comes from the state government or the federal government always costs you more money. Just remember that. It, it just never ends. <laughs> and, you know, the further we can stay away from, from the state of Vermont government, the better off we'll be with everything. Our schools, our community, everything. 
I, so I would agree with that. Having worked with towns for years in transportation planning and worked with the state bureaucracy on this, so <laughs> I tell you what, the reason I'm so outspoken about this, there is a hell of a lot more intelligence and good idea and creativity and flexibility sitting in the living rooms of these communities than there is in our bureaucracy. And there, there are a lot more minds there. And, these, and the people in those communities are not flashes in the pan. They are not there for two years. They live there, and they've got a real interest in preserving that school. You see that in the quality of the schools. Now, I know there are disparities around the state. Some of that, you know, there are a lot of causes for that. I, you know, I we've looked at this inside out ourselves, and I don't see how shuffling around resources. Some of these are the communities themselves. You know, they have an identity that maybe doesn't support that. And I don't care how much money you throw at it, it's not going to fix that problem. You know, this is a responsibility we have as people, and we have to, we have to stand up and maintain that. I'm just worried that that is getting yanked away from the people. And I know that we will not get as good a result from the bureaucrats. I work in that, and I've, you know, I've seen it I, in transportation. I saw it. I worked with great engineers. And every time we'd have a project, you'd be amazed at the number of good ideas that came up around projects that we just didn't think about. And and then, then impacts on communities we didn't think about. You know, and that's that's why this is so important. We Vermont's very unique in this still, in that we don't have county government, we have town and you've got mm -hmm. state. And our, we still really participate. And we're seeing this erosion of that town meeting type environment where, you know, and that is a great concern to me because if we lose that, we lose a significant piece of our culture mm -hmm. and quality of our, our quality of living for kids and for people. So well, sh uh, should we be taking a poll here tonight to see like what yeah. the feeling is of the community members that have shown up in terms of an alternatives yeah. approach and what, what key components might be part of that alternative approach? I know for one, like my, my druthers would be anything to avoid the weighted vote, you know. Um, I, I sat years ago as a representative for the town of Woodbury on the Central Montsal Waste District Board. That's a weighted vote. And you had Barry Town, Montpelier, and uh, Barry City. And they were the big dominant forces there. And every other town had to get, we would call each other up and make sure everyone showed up, because we got everyone there by one vote. We could eke it out, <laughs> eke it out. But you know, lo and behold, and quite frankly, actually Barry City and Barry Town got together. Mm -hmm. The others were done. That's what it helped worked out. And by what, but unless you had that one extra vote, and you know, sure enough, there'd be always, you know, there was, they were more conservative, and you know, the Montpelier S group, we're like they're pushing for recy mandatory recycling, for instance, in Barry City and Barry Town. No way, in Northfield, no way. We're not going to mandate that. And you know that's all old news now. But they stymied that for years, and they would get that one vote always pulled to their side. Um, and and it's you know it's you know don't fool ourselves. We're human human beings. The U.S. Constitution's written the way it is. State laws are written the way they are. Not because Everyone's going to go out and violate every law, but it's in our DNA. Every one of us has that programmed in our DNA. It's part of our survival instinct and self-interest. Your family comes first, you know, your community then comes first and, you know, your wallet comes first. And we all, you know, if we were all millionaires, we could all maybe act differently, although to such a show we might, might act, behave even worse, but um, the reality is you need checks and balances, and when you have a weighted vote like that, the t communities with the, with, the, with the clout are going to collaborate, and they're going to wheel and deal on the telephone, like I saw happen time and again for years and years and years, and you know, there's always a good argument for the other side. It's not good and bad. There are two valid arguments, and who's going to carry the day? And you know it will not be us. But this will we not will be the small school. Just to that make sure people understand, <coughs> if we do have to have a new roof, it will be only Callis who bonds for it and pays for it. <laughs> so we, we, we won't be able to get anybody else to help us. We have to understand that if we go this route, that's what may happen. However, we have built into our budget 
long enough, uh, enough money. I understand that we've been taking care of things as we go along, so we shouldn't have a huge, big need um, to, to redo roofs and, and redo stuff for all, all kinds of safety stuff. We keep up with that. I think. As we always have. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, how is that different than what you've already It done? won't be. I just yeah. wanted to make sure people yeah, understood, I, you know. I, that, that, I that wanted that. to make people understand that that's the way we've always done it. Yeah. 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 And, well, I'd like to speak to the fact that um, you... Just hoping that people keep in mind when it comes to town meeting day and it's time for you to vote on our budget, that our per pupil cost is going to keep going up, up, up. There is no way around it. So my one of my big frustrations in working with Act 46 has been constantly hearing, we need to lower taxes, we need to lower taxes, we need to lower taxes, we're spending too much money on our kids. This is too much money. $16,000 per student is too much money. And our numbers are going down. We're projected to go under 100 kids in a couple of years under 100 kids. When, it, we, when I first got here, it was over 130. So costs are going up. Salaries of teachers go up every year. We need a new roof. We need a new hot water heater. We need, we need, we need. And our numbers are going down. So are you prepared to keep paying more for students? Cindy Gardner Morris, I don't see anything in what's proposed that's going to control the funding. Right. spending. No, they did that study and it said it wasn't going to save money. This is not a question about money. Um, I'm, also just, I'm also talking about one of the biggest fears that I hear when people talk about 46 over and over and over again is they're going to close our school. They're going to close our school or they might close Worcester. Oh my gosh. So if it came to the point where we are paying $25,000 per student, just say, just throwing it out there, are you really wanting to keep Callis open? No, but it's our decision then. And That's right. It should be our decision. decision. It should not be I, 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 was, I right. was teaching in Cabot the first year they got their, um, their school began to cost them a million dollars. And they were pretty upset about that. But it was their decision. They decided not to go with Twinfield. They valued their small school. They loved their... Um, their teams, their sports, so they knew their kids. The, the plan had yeah. been that to put into the Articles of Agreement that not only did the board have to vote, this is, this is my other confusing, the thing I'm really confused about when people keep saying this, the board would have to vote with a certain majority and the town would have to vote to close the school. That's, That's not, how we were planning on setting it up. That was the plan. The problem is with that, and the lawyer said this at that meeting. You were there, I was there. He said, you cannot encumber future ports. Those articles of agreement, yeah. a year from now, they can yeah. change them. Yeah. Yeah. We do not That's control right. that majority. So they, <laughs> that, just like the U.S. Senate, change. right? The That's U.S. Senate right. rule. The, vote, the voters do not get that option. Once you right. say yes, you are out. Then it's, then it's the yeah. unified district that is the power, and you're at... They said this, you could not encumber them. You know, so that means, okay, well that unified board says, well, we're just gonna change those articles of agreement. And they do that. And well, it, even if it's in their it charter, is. they could get the charter changed. The other the other thing the other thing I'm very cognizant of is that there have been small towns in Vermont over the last several years who have said, Our school is too small, we can't afford it, we are going to close the school. Yeah. Now I think the People in Callis have those kinds of brains that they can figure out that, you know, this really isn't working. Let's see what we can right. do by what schools we can ship our kids to or whatever. But I honestly believe the people in Callis and Worcester will know when the time comes mm -hmm. and they will act accordingly. Well, truthfully, the population in our school, I mean, it hasn't been down. When I was on the board 2000 to 2006 ish, I mean, we got down into the 90s. And it's bumped up and down. We're very small school statistically, but we draw families because of this school. That's I mean, that yes. we've been pretty stable. You know, that's been a long time. Now, the, I mean, the statewide average is dropping about a percent a year. At least it was. I may have changed since, but it's still dropping. But we've been fairly stable, and it's because of the quality of our school. And you know what? It has nothing to do the, with the wealth of our community. It's because of what we put into it. Mm -hmm. And we will essentially be punished. I mean, punished for doing good fiscal planning, 
punished for really participating in our schools and putting out good good students. Mm -hmm. And you know that really bothers me. I mean, I there's something fundamentally really wrong with higher education. I mean, right now the elementary is the only it's the last best in of kind of public participation in the school system. And Scott Thompson and I we wrote a, an alternative, which we submitted to Shap Smith before Act 46. We actually proposed to increase, instead of just having local elementary boards still actually answering to the people, or to the, the, the people in the towns, we said, let's take this using the Regional Planning Commission model and take one elected official from every municipality, basically on county lines, on the RPC line, creating a body that would regulate state level education decision making. Mm -hmm. A lot of this cost that comes down is usually not, not driven in common sense. And you know, I think we would begin to reel this in. But they're doing exactly the opposite. They're they're pushing the communities out of this. And that bothered if you want fiscal control, that's going by the way. And you've just proven every state that they've done this in, it's been the case. And so I mean we're just walking the same route. And this you know, if we go down this path, then we're going to have 20 years of real, a real mess to deal with, mm -hmm. to dig out of this. And that's where, you know, I've been very vocal and very participatory in this for years. I've worked, I've walked this walk of working with municipalities in my work all my <laughs> life here. And, and I've worked with bureaucracy, I've worked with the towns. And I tell you what, I see where the real intelligence lies, and it is not at the top. It's in this bottoms-up decision making. We want to control the quality and our cost. This is where we do it. Oh, I have a question. I, I have one question. Oh, oh. Uh, on the questionnaire that's going to be circulated, um, are these arguments going to be clearly put into these into the questionnaire? In other words, because there there seems to be the reasons for and the reasons against. Um, well, the way, yeah. so we have a draft survey right now, and the way it's currently worded is a little bit more open-ended, sort of, what are your values, you know, what do you value? Um, so, for example, how important is it to you that there be a local board, or, you know, how important is it to you um, that we, I can't remember how the questions are worded, but they're, they're not, it's not an, this or this, which one would you choose? It's, it's not, not kind of, it's not a vote, like right. under this, under that. Is that uh, how strongly do you feel it's important to continue to own our own building, to have our own budget, uh, to control our, our own school? And I'm trying to make it, we're, we're trying to make it short, but to gather information. And also to say, you know, what's the most important thing for you because having a local school, what's the most important mm -hmm. thing for you? What do you value? You know, what's, and, and a few of, try to get some comments of, from people as well as that. And, and mostly we need it to show the state that we have contacted our community and this is what our community wants. Do you have a small question? Are you going to use SurveyMonkey? I, I, we haven't quite decided how to do it yet. I wondered if once you've got the survey that goes out to all the people, can you go back to another question in the survey? Or is it going to cut you off, and you can't change something you previously wrote? Oh, I we'll look at we'll look at that. That's so a, that's, that's a important concern. because yes. okay. yep. if it's relative valuations, yeah. right. you want to be able to. I, I would. This is so just, so important. I would, okay. we'll I look look would rather that. have a piece of paper and deliver it to everybody's house. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be self-selecting. Yeah. Well, it won't be, be self-selecting if you do that, and we'll have much more power, more weight as a survey if everybody has an opportunity rather than self-selecting to participate. Like In other words, so that's handing it, taking it to every house would be better. Uh, if you want an accurate Yes, that's what sample, I, I have to I figure that out. Some of us don't, don't have computers. I think SurveyMonkey yeah. is going to slam yeah. the whole thing right at the get-go. Yeah. Yeah. Not everybody has computers. I agree with you wholeheartedly. That's what yeah. I was Do you need volunteers to walk so around? At the if we can figure out, that's you know, maybe idea. we can just have people on the streets and deliver you 15 or 20 uh, surveys and you can deliver them to everybody on the street. Uh, maybe we can 
you know, or ask people to strategic volunteer. locations for people when they pick well, up. Well, that, again, is self-selecting when you yeah. leave it at the, at the town mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. stores. A great problem yeah. with this is that, you know, when you ask questions, you don't, this almost needs to be done in a town hall type forum. Yeah. I mean, I was advocating from the well, very beginning of this process town, special to town get out to the public, school, really yeah. have public meetings. They didn't do it because it got very under, much under the cover. Right. And it, Chantel knows it. I multiple times in those meetings, I said, "We've got to be having public meetings now. Get them educated." But that's this what we're is trying where to do we right now. Out. So we've had, I mean, we've had a good yeah, but this, the last couple of times but for people at large yeah. in the community. This is where this this. Is the biggest decision this town has made in many, many, many years. I thought we just needed to publicize the last I ones. Be nice. yeah. Put the but same that here. But there was never public. I mean, I was at almost all those. Yeah, Anyone like that here. would come to something like that, yeah. you would not have understood a word. They, they needed to be doing. I mean, I work in public. You know, you do what they call local concerns meetings, where you get out and you listen to public. And say, this is what we're doing. Here's the rough outline. Talk to us. Um, that's really important and here we're kind of after the fact and so you know what you do a survey and questions leave huge gaps and all the little details that are really important this is where discussion is really important it's the why town meeting is very successful people I, know a lot I, of I think one thing we can do is figure out how we're going to get it to everybody and <laughs> call <laughs> email some of you and, and so forth. But be, I hear you. But before you go, before you go, make sure you sign the the sheet on uh, that you were here. Please, it's on the round table back there, and so we know how many people came, and that way we can contact you as well. You had a question? Why don't yeah. you just mail it? It's expensive. <laughs> it's it, it's Did just. Did you bring your piggy back? It's three hundred and fifty dollars just for the postage. But we maybe we will. Maybe that's Where's what we that will do. Let's have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the bond issues for this. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, maybe we uh, we'll talk about it. Yeah. You mail this. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And thank you for doing that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, but I thought John had a good point. Can we do a little rough survey of how many people yeah. feel how right now? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'm going to let somebody else. If you uh, getting it to the people that are here tonight, I think probably we should be concerned about getting it to the people that are here tonight as well. Uh, I made a few calls and they're completely oblivious. All I needed was a they from came from Dot and. I didn't make the first one because I came back down with pneumonia. Oh. And I didn't think it was a very good idea to come to that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm here tonight and I, you know, I mean, if there's any way that I can help, I, I'm available. Doesn't every resident get a copy of, I don't know exactly what the publication is called, but is it the bus stop yeah, or bus the stop? This, um, no. 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 no, 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 so it's only those of us who currently have children in the system, I, yeah. mostly. or if you sign up on the um, okay, so it's the newsletter that's put out by the school district, it mm -hmm. comes in the mail, it's uh, like it, it um, used to come in the world, I, and the world yeah, isn't just, delivered okay. anymore. Yeah. It did used to come in the world, but, but we get it in the mail, and um, you know, yeah. Yeah. you can also get it by email, okay. But I'm just thinking, that I, I just want to speak to the fact that I feel like those folks who have been on the school board um, and participating in this, and um, that if you have access to the internet and you're on Front Porch Forum or you're reading things like the bus stop, I, I feel like the opportunity to participate has been reasonable. I don't, and it's just a matter of the challenge of getting here. I saw neighbors running. I saw a lot of neighbors, and I live on the far end of East Calais, Woodbury Cabot Line. People, are, it, it's hard to get to these meetings, just like it can be difficult to get to town meeting because it's not on a weekend. Um, so I just appreciate the opportunity and the number of meetings that have been held and the effort, folks, Chantel, Scott Thompson, over, it seems like it's been a couple year conversation that this has been very 
that there's been a plea to us as a community mm -hmm. to participate. And I just don't want to diminish, th let that go unnoticed. Because um, I, I think, um, and maybe it's heightened for those of us who have children in the school system currently, um, or have worked in the school system, and I've been in both those positions, um, as a part-time employee. Um, who couldn't, there was no full-time job, so I took a job somewhere else because there, that full-time position didn't exist here. Um, so uh, the, the efforts are appreciated, but I still feel strongly like we have these wonderful structures in place at the district level. We have a curriculum coordinator. If there's inequity going on when our kids are not showing up at U32 prepared from Worcester and Callis, let's do a better job of working with the superintendent and the special education program and the curriculum coordinator who's paid well to do that for us as a district. Let's do that. Why would we need to conform to a new model to make that happen? I just don't understand. I think that SU, I mean, they all have the learning outcomes that are SU wide. I mean, I could be wrong. I don't. Yeah, that's I'm right. pretty sure that it's like all first graders, all second grade. I mean, I feel like six going into seventh. Was what was oh, okay. Right. I, but I do feel like that's a lot of work with. The teachers are working on yes. like if you like yes. during their you know in service days I so I feel good I feel good about that that they're working really hard at that and their professional development is like the yeah. same throughout the district. Questions back here. Um, I I have a really hard time not speaking up when I hear um, um, uh, something that's not factual because it's going on camera and then that's how things like spread and become the truth when they're not, um, it's not cows in Worcester. Okay. I don't know how that got. That's what I heard in, from you in the beginning. No, That's no. what I was hearing. Two no. schools. No. There are two it, schools, it, and that it, it must have No, she was talking about uh, okay. free and reduced lunch at cows in Worcester, and I was talking about something else. Preparedness so. for seventh grade. That's what yeah, I was Yeah, preparedness hearing. for okay. seventh grade. I did not say that those okay. are the two, two schools. Uh, There's not just two schools. That's what I heard. So, but let me finish real quick. So, like, there'll be like, you know, it might be math at one school one year for two or three or four yeah, years in a row, and then it's like language arts okay. at this other school for five years in a row until something changes. And, you know, it's definitely, I was saying it does not follow the free and reduced lunch pattern. It has to do with completely other things. I wasn't talking about free and reduced lunch, just that it sounded like there are two schools that are sending kids to U32 that are not as prepared as the other towns, and that is one of the rationales for why we need no, to have no, one no, universal that, board. No, no, that, that's okay. not, I'm sorry no. if I, okay. I did not I, mean that. But I do know that over the years, it's always been different towns. I mean, for the last 50 mm -hmm. years, it hasn't been Berlin or it hasn't okay. been mm -hmm. somebody else. And they're, huh. So it, 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 it's like everything else, it cycles. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's yeah. a cycle. So you, had, you had something? Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'd be curious to see a show of hands of people who would, uh, um, favor local control and those who would favor uh, regional control. Sir, what's your name? Ron Thompson. Ron Thompson. Thank you. I was just curious about that. I mean, who are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Meaning it maintaining like our local everybody. boards as opposed to having a consolidated board yeah. structure. Yeah. 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 I'd be curious yeah. about that. Who supports continuing the local board structure? Say that again. Who supports, supports uh, continuing the local control structure? Mm -hmm. Is somebody counting me? Yes, could somebody count? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the other. I think it's well, just about, just about yeah. everyone. So ask the other question. And yeah. the, the, the other question is, you know, he's unsure. I'm unsure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to figure it out. And do we want to ask the other question? Is it moot? <laughs> No, ask question. Who, who, thinks, who thinks that we should move toward a consolidated board, single board structure as Act 46 originally anticipated? I'll be, the, I'll be the brave one. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta have one. Poor Act 46 would be all by itself. It needs company. Did you just mean the federated system? You didn't say any of those alternative options. Well, yeah, you, didn't, you didn't give us that choice. Right. <laughs> so was it a federated, could someone use the right lingo? Well, I think the, the first the yeah. first one was consolidated board. Alternative governance structure with maintaining local boards. That was the one that had that majority. Right. Mm -hmm. The second one was unsure. 
think there was one vote, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the third one was okay. preferred mm -hmm. structure as written in the law. Okay. That's the but one I think the, the <laughs> that's question that we're hoping to, to make our stand on is about combining the, you know, the finances with the towns. I think that's the question we should also ask. How many people would like to combine our resources? <laughs> 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 I don't think we need to think about it. But yeah, uh, I just um, I met with Janet recently, and they did get a new, I don't know the terminology, but a new part passed to uh, amend Act 46. Well, it did pass, and it said that we that it is now legal to transfer the debt to the town. Mm -hmm. That's not and, in actual. And it has its problems. It's actually in a separate it's bill. It's not in an yeah. education bill. It's yeah. in like it's a, a <coughs> house is miscellaneous. What is yeah. that? Well, it's, 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 it's what yeah. it is. Is yeah, they, you have they're giving you permission to transfer the debt to the town. But, um, Transfer what debt? I don't know what you're So, doing. for in other words, East Montpelier, instead of their district, the school district having that debt, and then if we made one big district, it would have the debt. Then mm -hmm. they could, yeah. East Montpelier could take their debt and transfer it to the town of East Montpelier rather than the school uh, district. But the difficulty with that is that when forward. people people who are on income sensitive tax rates. Oh. The income sensitivity does not kick in on the town part of tax. Uh, yeah. So it, hurt so all the it would hurt town. all the people on income sensitivity because income sensitivity is only for your education taxes. Yeah. Well, screw, always screw the poor people. <laughs> yeah, and they didn't realize that when they were past this. They, they didn't consult me, John. <laughs> <laughs> what were they learned? Uh, <laughs> they don't. They don't know what they're doing down there. Both of the time. But also, so the question, they know how to fight with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The debt it just made forward. life miserable for Does everybody. the debt moving forward <laughs> then get absorbed? That that's. Mm -hmm. I believe that's current debt, correct, right, 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 up to this yeah, point. Yeah, but then yeah, there's the yeah. issue of investment in the school. Oh, yeah. Which is course. still the same issue yeah, about... Sure. Well, actually, in Janet's letter, at least the one that I got, she said that that would not benefit Callis as much as right. some of the other changes right. that were made. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I really thank everybody for coming. I mean, it's a horrible time of day. What? Uh, I still think we should ask that question about combining the finances. Because isn't that the, the stand that you're hoping to, to make when you write up the new proposal? Is to what? To justify the alternate model is that the debt and the equity from the five towns is why we want an alternate model. Oh, that would be part of the survey for sure. Oh, yeah. But I think we should ask right here, right now. Yeah. Yeah. How many oh. people here? <coughs> well, how? How many well, people well, here want to pay the debt? Nobody does. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. 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 In its essence, is trying to be fiscally responsible, right. mm -hmm. but I think you know, for for us, the struggle is is that we don't trust the other towns to be fiscally right. responsible. And well, we've seen them not be exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And, whole life. and I think you know, to me, it's it's yeah, it's it's born of, of you know the the money and the fiscal responsibility, but it's really about <laughs> control. And I think a lot of us have chosen to be in Calus for the school and mm -hmm. for the the community, mm -hmm. community and control. So. I mean, to me, it's, you know, it, it, I, I think, uh, you know, we've done a good job of voting for our school budgets. You know, we yeah. clearly support our schools. And if we feel like it's ready, it, it's time, you know, enrollments are down and, and it's time to, you know, absorb with someone else, I think we can make that decision. Mm -hmm. I know I, we can. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if we need, you know, I, I forget this, this gentleman's <laughs> name up here, but it's top-down legislation and, you know, I, I, I don't think we're ready I really don't think we're ready for that yet. And it, yeah. Chantal asked the question about the $25,000 per pupil. I'd probably vote yes because then my, if this school closed, my house would not sell. I mean, that's the part. That's what I'm really worried about, like long term. Yeah. Like the value of my property would diminish greatly. And that's like selfish, but that's. Self-interest drives everything. <laughs> yes. I mean, essentially, it's robbing the poor to get to the you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs>
Well, I'm, I'm really nice. impressed with how many people came for a second go round. <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you. How many people are here for coming? If you all signed in, in I'll have a count. Dog. And if you uh -huh. didn't sign in, please sign in on your way out. <laughs> <laughs> in my own dog, that's why I didn't make it first. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.